Hello, and welcome to the first recast for this year's Christmas holiday break. Tracy and I will be taking three weeks off this year to spend with our families for the holiday season. During that time, we have selected three of our favorite episodes from last year. The first is our chat with the indomitable Anne Perry who was gracious enough to appear on episode 157. Since that episode appeared, there have been a few additions to her repertoire. Number three in her Elena Standish mystery series came out in September of this year, and it was called A Darker Reality. Her other series featuring Daniel Pitt, the fifth in that mystery series, Three Debts Paid, will be published in April of 2022. And then she also has number 19 in her Christmas Legacy novella series that came out in November of this year. With those few notes, I will turn this over to... I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to episode 157 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we have a visit with the master of mysteries, Anne Perry. Her second book in the Elena Standish mystery novel is A Question of Betrayal. This is number two in her Elena Standish mystery series. Written Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, has lost contact with its informant in northern Italy. Just as important information about the future plans of Austria and Nazi Germany is coming to light. Young Elena Standish, to her surprise, is the only person who can recognize MI6's man because he's her former lover. Aidan Strother betrayed Elena six years ago, throwing the shame on her entire family. Now, with so much to prove, Elena heads to Trieste to track down Aidan and to find out what happened to his handler, who has mysteriously cut off contact with Britain. We are thrilled to introduce Anne Perry to the program. She is the author of several of our favorite series. She is going to talk about her latest book. Welcome, Anne Perry. Thank you. You have an offshoot of the Thomas and Charlotte Pitt mystery series with your series featuring their son, Daniel. With the budding of women's rights coming up in the story timeline, will Jemima be getting a series of her own? I don't think that's very practical because she lives in New York. I can write about England because I am English and have lived there a long time. New York, I don't know so well. But I think I might bring her husband to be a policeman in Britain. Then I can get her in any episode I want. Full of fight and curiosity and battling injustices and so forth. But you have to be careful you don't introduce too many characters into a story so that it becomes just a, a sort of brief appearance for anybody you fancy. I find one of the best exercises as a writer is to take out characters I just like but really don't need. Give them another story later on. Well, that must be fun as a writer that you get to play with their lives. You can put certain people here and move this person there. 
as long as it works and as long as the publisher accepts it, I get some pretty tight editing. I've got two agents. Uh, well, I've got more than two because you, know, you have sub-agents for every language, etc. But two I communicate with regularly, one in Britain and one in America. They give me very good advice. I think if I were left unedited, I might make some awful howlers just because it pleases me. They help me to keep it on the straight and narrow because in the end, if you don't write something your publisher thinks is good, you're taking a very dangerous step. Each book has to sell as well as the last, at least. When you start going on the downhill slope, you can catch up with you very quickly. I don't like getting criticism saying, do this and do that and rewrite it. But honestly, they do help. We've been fans of Thomas and Charlotte Pitt and William Monk since the very beginning. Thank you. Now you've written Elena Standish. Just write the outline of the next one. I've got a new paragraph in my contract telling you about this because I think for any writer it's quite interesting. Every book is paid for in five. The first is to sign a contract. The second is to send a four, five, six-page single-spaced outline of the story. And boy, is that a discipline of the mind. You have to put everything down why they do it, and what it leads to. Done this thing several times. I hope it's going to be right, but I can't guarantee it. But it is such a good discipline, because they'll send it back to me saying, why does this person do that? Or, Where is this happening? And why would they do that? And you're contradicting yourself. You go back and do it again. But it means that by the time you get to actually write it, you know what each scene is meant to accomplish. It should make sense. Is there a reason that you left the Victorian age behind and upgraded to the 30s and 40s? Oh, yes. I haven't got into the 40s yet, and I don't know that I will, because when my publisher accepted the first Elena, she said, don't take it up into the war, because I, I do have a series set in World War One. It's only five books, but the hero is a chaplain in the trenches in World War One. He didn't know that. No. Oh, well, you, you might dip into it and you might like it, or maybe not. Oh, I'm sure if you wrote it, we will. I devour <laughs> okay, <so> everything you write. <laughs> I care about it a great deal. You can tell. I want to tackle the fear of war and the rise of Hitler, because I think it's very, very appropriate to our own times, and how easily we can not see what we don't want to see. I've got a young man in this one I'm outlining at the moment. And he begins as a Nazi Gestapo officer. And he's all correct, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, standing straight, great ambition, loves the fatherland. And he gradually sees some of the things that Hitler does and some of the weaknesses in Hitler's character, his tendency to panic and so forth. The story takes place during the Night of the Long Knives. It actually is a couple of weeks or so, the story of the Long Knives was three nights. He very slowly begins to realize what it is that he's following, but it's very difficult for him to make the break. It means if he sees honestly what he is witnessing with Hitler and the assassination of all Hitler's enemies, that it's not what he can bear to be. And that one of the things that makes him start thinking differently is he's married, his wife has the first baby. And a tiny baby just trusts you so much and is so dependent. And if you're a halfway decent person, your instinct to protect that child is so strong. So that is the basis for his being totally honest and his ambition has to go by the board. He risks his life. If I can't make a drama out of that, I should try something else like scrubbing floors. Oh, Absolutely. that sounds Please don't do really... That. <laughs> <laughs> Please keep writing. <laughs> yes. Is it difficult to come up with a new series? Well, with this one, you couldn't have stopped me. I've been trying to do it for nine years. Coming up with a Daniel, it was suggested to me. I felt I'd taken Pitt as far as I could, had nothing new to say about him. I'm like, they're about 34 of them. They said, we'll try working with his son. And I thought, I don't know that I want to do that. You want to do whatever your publisher tells you you should do. That is if you want to eat. You like Daniel? I like Daniel very much, but I like... Oh, good. Is it Miriam? Miriam. Yes. yes. I like her very much. Oh, good. Well, yeah, she's a fighter for women's rights. <laughs> to the time when we started chaining ourselves to railings and making a noise about it. I yes. can't bring it in too early because if it's historically inaccurate, it doesn't ring right. But yes, we're moving into the women's rights now and we're still in it. Well, I am very pleased 
that you have people that keep you on track and that you're so passionate about the timeline. Because I tell you, there's sometimes I read historicals and I just roll my eyes. I'm like, what? This doesn't make any sense. (laughs) The mistakes we have a tendency to make is to write a modern story in period costume. All of the material facts are right, but the people's hopes and desires and wishes are quite wrong. I mean, today you can hear even children in the kindergarten use ethnic language and goodness knows what. In Victorian times, nobody would have thought such words, but they wouldn't have expected to have freedom and talk about my rights. You just didn't have many rights. The Married Women's Property Act was in the 1860s, and up until that time, your husband owned all your property including your child and your clothes, and maybe your mother died and left you a wedding ring or something. Everything belongs to your husband. You cannot be robbed because you don't own anything. Can you imagine that? If you were a widow, you would have to find a man, somebody in your family or something, to take over the estate. You might be lucky if if he was a small tradesman. You might find that you were actually better at it than he was, and you'd be allowed to go ahead. You know, not being able to own anything... And if your husband says, oh, she's crazy, you could find yourself locked up with no recourse. I mean, no wonder we got cunning. How else are we going to survive? And no wonder people are angry. If you've got a child, you want to survive. You need to survive because the child needs you. I did one story, I think it was in the Monk series, where a woman did kill her husband. And Monk had a feeling there was a lot more to the story than was being told. And her husband was actually sexually abusing their son. What is she to do? If she tells anybody he's doing that sort of thing, they'll shut her up in the madhouse. In the last William Monk, if I remember right, the woman that was murdered by the pirates, to say it lightly, she was independent. She had money coming. She was an heiress. As long as she was alive, when she was dead, he could take it all. Married women had somebody to look after them, but in many ways they had it pretty tough, do as you're told, because there wasn't much in the way of reliable birth control. Uh, Yes, definitely. We talked a little bit about Daniel. Will Daniel grow in the series, and will that series continue on? If he doesn't grow, the series will be terminated anyway, because it's a bad job if your characters don't grow at all. So, yes, he will have to grow. How long he'll go on, I don't know. I mean, how long will I go on? I don't mean I will retire, but I might lose my marbles or even just die. (laughs) Well, I hope for for many years. Well, I hope so, too. As long as I keep them up to standard, I think they'll probably go on. But if I start repeating myself or it becomes boring, they won't renew the contract. Normally, I go a year at a time, you know, get a year's contract and write to contract. Because it's how I earn my living. I don't, don't survive without it. I don't see him going as far as World War I, which is 1914, simply because my editor said, please don't take him into the war. But she might find by the time we get there, I think it was only in 1912 now, because I've written the next one after the one that's going to come out soon. I've just finished Daniel 5. He doesn't have a title yet. I don't give them titles because they always change them anyway, and then I get upset, so I said, you, you call it. So you said that the publisher didn't want Elena to go into World War II, and they didn't want Daniel to go into World War I. Is there a reason they don't want either character to move into the wars? Well, it could be because I've written five war stories already, and they were mostly on the front line in the trenches and so forth. I had five main protagonists, and I only realized afterwards that not one of them Fired a gun in anger. Uh, the main character was a chaplain in the trenches, after my own maternal grandfather, who was a chaplain in the trenches in World War One. His younger brother is in MI6. The two sisters, one drives an ambulance on the Western Front, and the other one stays at home raising her children. Here's a little bit about her husband, who's in the Navy. And the other character, war correspondent. And I got all the way through without any of them having killed anybody. I think that speaks to... Your character, <laughs> truly. Well, it does, because I didn't even realize until I, I thought of it. I said, nobody's a soldier. It's kind of refreshing, though. Well, I hope so. I did it with the way I wanted to do it. It was a labor of love. Well, there was one for each year of the war, although the war was only for about four years long. I had one which led up to the war, 
and ended with when war was